Thank you so much for having me and for this, yes, an interesting morning. I'm assuming you both have big plans to be in front of cable TV all day, or perhaps PBS carrying it live as well. Right, yeah, yeah. All right, so let's get started with questions on impeachment for obvious reasons here. There is a constitutional standard, of course, for impeachment, but a lot of question as to really what that high crimes and misdemeanors can even mean. So what does that mean to you? What will you be looking for in order to prove that standard as these hearings get underway? Sure, I, mean, I think, you know, I think Ram and I would agree that what we went through in 1998 did not meet the standard. Uh, and I think if you look and you read, you know, things like the Federalist Papers and any of the historical accounts of how the Constitution was put together, what they were really looking at was making sure that the president didn't abuse his power, abuse his power to um, uh, act in a treasonous way uh, against the interests of the United States, act in a way that he used his power to personally benefit himself, his family, or his business associates. Um, so I think that was the, the, the construct for the, the framers. And I think that's why what we're looking at today is much closer to what they considered a high crime and a misdemeanor than maybe uh, 1998. Well, I think you got to draw a contrast, uh, mainly because take the most recent, obviously, Clinton and Nixon played out for a year and a half before you got to the House. Every, think about this for a second. This is really about six or eight weeks old. And so it's, when you think about it comparatively from a time frame, we're just learning, and everything you're learning has been really about either uncovering something from the whistleblower, a document that's been released, or, or testimony behind closed doors. So this is the first public, uh, you know, the curtain's getting raised on what has been behind closed doors or in a secret computer, and I needed to get that out for therapy reasons. Uh, um, be, and that's different than either what happened for Nixon, Clinton, and when you really think going way back and read history for Johnson, that was all about reconstruction and his abandonment, which played out also over a longer window. So that's number one, which is different. I would agree 100%. I'm, I will say I'm a little surprised that Joe quoted the Federalist Papers. I'm really proud of you, Joe. I can't thank you. Because I don't remember you at the desk ever quoting anything about the Constitution it's, at all. It's, so. it's, it's one of many things Rom taught me. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, retirement's done you a great yes. job. Uh, so I would say that kind of, it's only six weeks. And I think really the burden now on the hearings is to justify that there's a case here because everything to date has only been in six or seven weeks. You don't really have a phone call. You have a summary of a phone call. The actual phone call document exists in the most secure computer in the National Security staff, which is ironic, because every lawyer that heard anything said, hide that right now. So this is a revealing stage to build a justification if, in fact, what happened here rises to the level, as Joe says, when they originally constructed the area of holding a president accountable for his or her actions, rises to that standard. And I think that's gonna be incumbent for all of us to make a judgment about what happened here. Was it actually a violation of two things, both breaking the law and unethical? Not the same thing. And I think that will be what has to happen over the next period of time. And there is one of, I know you, everybody says, oh, it's political. Well, it's legal in a political wrapping. It's not political in and of itself and only about politics, impeachment. It is a political wrapping at the core is a legal question. So you're saying the, the illegal part is what the focus needs to be, the unethical part, not reason okay. for impeachment, per se. I've been in the Oval Office on a lot of direct head to state phone calls. I've never heard two presidents that I worked for ever say to them, we really need you to do us a favor by investigating my political opponent. And the irony of that situation is, and what's really unbelievable is, our entire foreign policy for 10 years was to convince Ukraine to separate politics from the criminal justice system, and we have a president on the phone who's convincing them to put politics back into the criminal justice system for us, and for, more importantly, not us, for him. And I've never ever, there's national security discussions, there's discussion about everything that's related between the two countries and the context, but never asking a foreign head of state to involve their legal system 
in helping to advance a political interest here at home by researching and obviously digging up dirt on a political opponent. I mean, each of you served in the White House. Acting Chief of Staff Mulvaney said, there's always politics in foreign policy. There's politics that's why, in that's, everything. That's why he's acting. <laughs> okay? Because that is not, no, politics is around, it's a White House and people are involved in politics, but not in asking a foreign head of state to involve their criminal justice system in our political process by digging up dirt on a possible political candidate for the other party. Never. Outside the bounds. Yeah, I mean, I, I enjoyed More watching. More than outside the bounds, yeah, yeah, legally. I, I enjoyed watching um, Chief of Staff Mulvaney come into the briefing room only because uh, it was clear he thought he could just walk in there, say what he's been, convince everybody, and it was really easy to stand behind that podium. Trust me when I tell you it's not really easy to stand behind that podium. Um, and it, I enjoyed immensely watching him uh, flounder. Um, but <laughs> that's just a personal note. Yeah, it's 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 interesting that um, you know he did admit to the quid pro quo and say it's no big deal, get over it. Uh, but what I found the most interesting was what he said next. Uh, you know, a few minutes later, and it was unprompted. No one asked him, but he he out of nowhere said, "And by the way, everything I did was at the direction of the president of the United States." And you know, normally, if you look at Nixon, he had Haldeman and Ehrlichman, and to a point, John Dean, and then not John Dean, trying to insulate the president from culpability in any of these things. And I think it's the natural act of political aides to insulate the president from things. Everyone involved here, from uh, Mulvaney to Rudy Giuliani, have all said, I'm, I was just doing what the president asked me to do. Um, Ram talked a little bit about uh, the differences between then and now, and, and even with Nixon. With Nixon and with Clinton, through the use of grand juries and Senate testimony, everyone who knew something testified, including, the pres including President Nixon, because his tapes were the testimony. Bill Clinton talked to the grand jury. The big difference on this one is everybody with real first-hand information is refusing to testify. So I think we, you know, as a country, we're taking a little bit of a leap of faith here. The Democrats believe, rightly so, that they have enough to impeach the president, but we don't know everything about how far, how deep this went. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one of those things that we live in an imperfect democracy, but we should know all of those things. There are those who've said that should, for example, Nixon's impeachment be taking place today, he wouldn't have had to step down, that he could have fought it as President Trump is doing now. Um, and as you talked about, clearly, President Clinton fully cooperated, gave blood samples even, I believe. So is this something where that sets up another potential constitutional crisis with people inside the White House not agreeing to cooperate? Or is it a smart strategy that could save the president, keep him in office? So two points I'd make. One is slight differences here. Actually, when the impeachment process was going through, President Clinton started at 62%, grew to 68 and when they impeached him, went to 73 Nixon collapsed during the process, was down to, I'm doing this by guess, but I think it was 23% or 24 not that we have, clearly yeah. numbers don't yeah. matter to yeah. us. Uh, there were, uh, we're not, we're not poll driven we're not, at all. Not that we're, yeah. Listen, yeah. We're, we're not driven by polls. No. no, not at all. Uh, numbers, Never. What, what's interesting to me, so President Clinton goes up, Richard Nixon, what happened for Nixon was, as he collapsed, he became a liability for Republicans. And the Republicans said, okay, basta, this is over. The most interesting poll number in the last three weeks, in my take, was the one that I think it was ABC's Washington Post poll that showed him going from 87 to 74 percent among Republicans, and that's without a hearing. And that you know, there's a president, and the reason Democrats stayed with President Clinton was he was at 68 and going up, and they said, you know what, this ain't worth it. If they think the president is a liability, Trump, you will begin to see Republicans figure out their own constitution versus the constitution of the United States of America. And to me, what's kind of intriguing is you took that number and the most relevant point of last week was in the reddest of red state with Donald Trump going into Kentucky to try to save Governor Bevin. He lost. 
which means Trump doesn't have invincibility. And when he says, I have your back, mm, that's not so great. It doesn't come with the cachet that it did a year ago. And remember, this plays out. Now, it's not going to go for a year. And I think that, and I, my own per view of this is you'll probably end up with an impeachment in the House. There'll be a hearing in the Senate. They'll say he did, he, what he did here is wrong. Doesn't add up to removal, and they will censure him like they did Andrew Jackson in 1836. I just had to prove that he's not the only person that read history with the Federalist Papers. I wanted to get my Sarah Lawrence money from my parents back. That's all. Rama is lucky that they didn't give grades at Sarah Lawrence. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> And that's right. It was, okay, we're, it was, it was pass fail, and I'm happy for yeah, that. Okay, yeah. happy. Just I mean, a commentary. That's the, all. There, there is a huge difference, though, between this um, impeachment and even Clinton's, but especially Nixon. Um, and I, this is all fresh in my mind because I interviewed Gabe Sherman uh, last week for my podcast. He wrote the book on Fox um, and Roger Ailes. And, you know, he quotes Roger Ailes as saying that the reason he created Fox was because if Nixon had a fox, he wouldn't have had to resign. Um, and so Nixon nor Clinton had, you know, what was a uh, basically party-run television uh, network. Couple that with the explosion of the internet and social media platforms, Donald Trump can talk to his base unfiltered every day. He doesn't have to tell the truth. He can, just, he can you know, yesterday, he said that um, Ivanka, his daughter, had created 14 million jobs, which is a little bit of a math problem since his entire administration has only created 7 million jobs. Um, but she's created 14 all by herself. People who read his Twitter feed who are supporters of him, they believe that. And they believe that this is a witch hunt. They believe that um, Adam Schiff is a Russian plant and that it's the uh, Ukraine, the Russians who helped Hillary, all of that um, nonsense. So I think we're, we're going to, in a very significant way, test our media landscape. And my guess is we're going to fail. Um, and it'll be a reason why um, uh, he, he won't be removed. The other thing I'd say is... You, you would say that would be, he won't be removed because of the media landscape, because of journalism, not because of a no, Republican-controlled no, Senate? I wouldn't say he won't be removed because of journalism, because I don't believe what Fox does and what happens on social media platforms is journalism. It's propaganda. So I believe that he won't be removed in part because of some of the propaganda. The other thing is, is you know, Rahm's right that the numbers are slipping a little bit among Republicans. But if you're a Republican in office, you face a very difficult choice. Um, if you stand with the president and you're, you're running statewide, it creates a huge problem. You have to write off the cities, you have to write off the suburbs, and you've got to turn out everybody who lives in a non-suburban area uh, to have any chance of winning. Um, and that's not a great formula for you, winning. I mean, you would agree. I mean, House Republicans, basically three quarters of the members live in safe Republican yeah. districts. Yeah. A senator in Maine, Colorado, North Carolina, Iowa, just to name four states randomly across the spectrum, all have a situation where they're now, over the last 20 years, swing independent, non-aligned voters has shrunk, but it's still for anybody. Nationally, it's 11 to 12% in any one of those states is still gonna be in those nine to 12%. That's the difference between winning and being defeated. And they, that's why I think the uh, vice that they will be in in the Senate was the President of the United States cannot just be simply said that he's not impeached. And that's why they're going to find some way to hold him accountable. And that's why I think they'll move towards the censure. But and still put them in a difficult position well, that's to have the, to vote that's, on censure. Yeah, yeah. You'll hurt his base or you'll hurt independent voters. What a beautiful place to put them, right there. And they have the choice. And Donald Trump will attack censure and he'll make it more valuable than it is. Yeah, I think if you look at the, if, you know, again, I think Ron properly articulated the, the problem on what happens with independence. But if you look at it from the other side, which is Trump has taken over the Republican Party and he's re remade the Republican Party. It is no longer the country club Republican Party. It is the, it is uh, non-college educated white voters around the country 
who it's the party of grievance, the people who feel like they've been left behind by the technological and global globalization, you know, and, and they react and respond uh, to Trump's rhetoric. Those people make up the bulk of the Republican Party right now. So if you cross Donald Trump, even if you don't, even if you don't get primaried, you're likely to lose because those people will stay home They'll support uh, support a third party candidate, um, uh, so it's it's a formula for and and I think the purest example I've seen of that this week is Nikki Haley. You know, here was someone who who um, developed a um, uh, an image of being somewhat independent at the UN. She she chided the president a couple times politically. She left, she took some time off, she sat with her pollster and decide, decided, how do I get to be president in 2024? And the decision they came to was to write a wet kiss book about Donald Trump. Can I pull this back? We've been... That's a, quite the way to put it. Ooh. <laughs> we've, we've, I've got a couple other if you want me to, but it's early. Pass on that. Yes, Mayor. Really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've, we've run, obviously, we've gone right to politics. Can I just pull back and just... Don't suspend this. You have a president of the United States on a phone with a foreign leader asking him to use their criminal justice system to investigate a potential political opponent in the next election. He, had, he talked about WikiLeaks and Russia. And, and, and don't but, forget holding up aid yeah, you know, he, that they needed. He asked China to investigate. He said on George Stephanopoulos on ABC, of course I would take opposition research from a foreign government. He has problems is because he has said publicly three times that he would do something that is illegal and nobody raised a flag and so it's not hard and you don't have to suspend belief to see a president of the united states who then used the tools of american foreign policy for his not na for not for our national security interests because it's clearly what he was doing in suspending the aid or holding it was against america's foreign policy objectives through president bush and through President Obama. Two separate, two different par parties, presidents, our, par our president of the United States. We had a singular foreign policy as related to Ukraine, Eastern Europe, and Russia. And he was withholding that aid that Congress had passed for his personal political benefit. And we can get into all the political machinations you want. That is the core question. And we're gonna ask ourselves, not just the Congress, ourselves as a country, is that legal and is that ethical? And that's not just for Congress and that's just not for the media, that's for all of us. And whether the system will hold somebody accountable that on the face of it, they have to disprove that's what would happen, but on the face of it is clearly illegal and clearly unethical. Has that question, in a sense, already been answered, given that, for example, you spoke about uh, the president's interview with Stephanopoulos there was, sure, reaction, but no talk was then it, it was of impeachment just, well, it was or like, anything. There was there reaction was... by the FBI director, which is actually a part of the law enforcement entity of the United States of America, that it is illegal. We, have a, we actually have the question by the FBI director, appointed by the President of the United States, which is, is this legal or illegal? And the, President of the, United States, and the FBI director appointed by this president said, it is clearly illegal. Fast forward. That is exactly what this happened here. We're holding aid from Ukraine that is fighting for its independence and its life from Russian inter interference. We're withholding it, not for any national security interest, but one thing. And so we actually forget China, forget Russia for a second, which is hard to do, but we have the FBI's judge director's judgment on this question. And yet Republicans remain in lockstep with the president. You've noticed. So to take this back to politics, I, I guess, because w what does that say about not even our state of politics, about our state of government? And sure, we, we, we can't quite contemplate, but if parties were reversed, is that it? That you have a president who is so powerful that it is not like Nixon when you had the GOP defectors, that you have a party that is in lockstep, but for all of things that previously, ostensibly, they would have been appalled by. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the one thing about the Nixon impeachment is Republicans broke late 
They were, they were a year and a half into this. Everybody thinks that there was an impeachment and he wasn't impeached. In 1973, there was a, the summer of impeachment. Um, and remember, in 1973... That's what summer looks like in Chicago. Yeah, it is summer, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, both weeks, right? Yeah. Summer. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. You're, tr you're supposed to sell our city. Yes. Come on. <laughs> anyway, um, and w what happened in the summer of 73, and it, some of this has to do with the media landscape, is they had these dramatic hearings. And in these dramatic, and most importantly, there were three television networks that everybody watched. You couldn't turn, there was no internet, there was no other way to get news except for a newspaper and, and, and TV and, and radio. Everyone covered this gavel to gavel. There was nothing else in the news to talk about. Uh, there was no alternative theories of the case. It was just what, what they saw. And Republicans uh, 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 did um, uh, uh, eventually leave the president. That, well, that's when he went below 30%. Yes, yeah. 30%. I do want to say one thing, Joe, and I'm sorry. We're, we're here for a conversation. I'm going to yell at him <laughs> for a second. I don't want to put too much bevy on whether it's social media, the, you know, the cable news channel. There's a core question. It's a legal question. And we're going to make a decision as a country, as a nation of laws, not of people. Is it legal and ethical for a president of the United States to engage a foreign government in our domestic politics? Full stop. And I agree with you, cable, Fox, et cetera, it's a changed landscape, et cetera, but the Constitution is the Constitution. Our character of our country and our credo as a nation of laws is, a, is something we hold up. Now that, I, you know, whether there's Fox and, and social media and Twitter, I don't want to get distracted by that because it's down a rabbit hole. There's a real question here and we got to remind ourselves in this process, is this legal? And it's in front of all of us, and not just to the land, media landscape. Sure. Um, that, this is the world I wish I lived in. Now let me, let me tell you about the world I do live in, um, which is, you, you, the, your question said, we, we seem to know all the facts. We do know. We, we, we know from the sort of second hand that we people... We know enough to be dangerous. We, well, we know, we know enough to impeach the president. We have a basic president. outline. We, we know enough to impeach the president. We could get a whole lot more of the people who were in the room all the time testified, but they've chosen not to. Uh, and the president's chosen to forbid them from doing that. So what we, the exercise we're about to go through is one of, not of it's not a legal procedure, it's, it's political theater. And it's can the Democrats convince the public that all of the things that Rahm said are true? Or can the Republicans convince the public that this is all some deep state conspiracy designed to remove the president, some sort of coup? Um, and again, I would love for um, Rahm's version to be true. What my worry is, is we've become a nation not of um, a people who consider issues and, and have a dialogue on issues. We've become a nation that wants to be entertained, and Donald Trump is the best example of that at all. We, he was a guy with no political experience who went out and ran his campaign like a reality show and got elected. So I think what the Democrats have to do um, is in addition to laying out the legal case, the moral case, the, the case for the, the, our own democracy, is to bring to life why what he has done in a way that engages the public. And this is all, of course, complicated. I mean, you've got a whole list of Ukrainian names, of individuals from the Foreign Service, the NSC. Is it a more complicated storyline? Of course, you lived through the Clinton impeachment, which played out sort of like a, a soap I opera. I, I don't think that, I, you know, let me, first of all, I just, so I actually think one of the things that I don't accept, Joe, there's a, that's a level of cynicism. I actually think what the public wants is actually all the politics, all the kind of crossfire to move aside, just give us the facts and a judgment. I, and I actually think why Adam Schiff is exactly the right person as a former prosecutor, he carries himself with that, we're just gonna go and get the facts. And I actually think the less theater from members of Congress, less theaters from the chairman and pursuing the facts would actually is the best politics is to look the less po least political, number one. Number two, what I think will help Democrats in this process and what it will hurt the president, one, 
you will never actually ever get the full transcript. We have a summary, and the summary is bad enough. What is in that computer, which is not, that can, I want to be clear, that computer is not for this phone call. That is for the most secure information America has about nuclear weapons that are around the world, other types of things that are going on, national security. That computer is not for a president's phone call with another head of state. Okay, that's number one. Number two, I will guarantee you will not hear from the chief of staff, the national security staff, for present and former key players in this process because the president of the United States, unlike the former president, this administration will not let them testify, which is in clear violation also of norms and the Constitution. So to me, in my view, unethical, illegal. That said, I also believe that key players and key pieces of information will not be provided. Which, so what we know is bad enough, and I don't think the administration will want you to know the full line by line call that went on. Because if it was helpful, you'd have it already. Now, Mayor, you have written that the impeachment process needs to be not just fast, it needs to be fair, that Democrats should not overstep. I said that fast should not become the enemy of fair. Um, I hate quoting myself, but that felt really good. Uh, <laughs> hey, hold on, can I quote Rom for a little bit? That's, that's my middle child. Yes, yes. <laughs> The, 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 the president this morning, I mean, we, we now have keys to the, the Republican strategy, and that is this memo where they have put out saying that he had reason to be skeptical of Ukraine corruption there. Uh, the president already this morning, I haven't checked it since I've been up here, but, you know, he tweeted several times, Democrats stacking the deck. So, so far, how have Democrats done in making the case, as you have laid it out, Mr. Lockhart, and how have Republicans done in defending their president. I'm going to take a page from Rom's book and quote from uh, an op-ed I did for the New York Times. <laughs> uh, and this was, quote yourself. This, this was before the answer. I mean, See, this feels really good. Yeah, Go it does. It does. I'm, hold on a second. Let me just, do I have everyone's attention? Good. Yeah. Um, uh, before uh, Pelosi made her announcement, I thought there were like three important things to do. One was, let's shift run this. Uh, because as much as I love Jerry Nadler, the Judiciary Committee is a circus. Um, and uh, Doug Collins, the Republican, is probably better at you know, disrupting than Nadler is at you know, doing a hearing. This, the second was doing most of the investigative work behind closed doors. Um, in the basement bunker. In, in the basement bunker, just because as soon as you take the cameras away, congressmen become different people. Um, and it's just, Ron can tell you, there are serious discussions that happen that as soon as you, the camera comes on, people, you know, uh, people change. And then the, the third was, you know, you've got to move expeditiously. This can't stretch uh, out. So on all three counts, and I, you know, I give Nancy Pelosi uh, the most credit for this, uh, because she held her fire until it became impossible not to move. And, and, I, and I think the reason that, you know, I changed my mind, and I think Rom was uh, kind of reluctant um, also, was, you know, the people who were calling for this in January, it was about 2016, it was about things that uh, Mueller was looking at and had no impact on the next election. What's, what went on with Ukraine has every impact on the next election because we now see an example of the president trying to manipulate the next election using and abusing the power of the presidency. And that's when uh, I think a, a lot of us changed our mind and said, we have no choice, even though we know the risks uh, uh, that come. So I give the Democrats really um, uh, high grades. I think Adam Schiff would like to take back the beginning of the first hearing where he, where he kind of was loose and, and it's very unlike him, um, but I think they've all done well. You know, I, it's, it's hard to say the Republicans have done well because they've changed their story 10 times now on what, but I think they've done okay too because their job is just to create confusion, is to just give their supporters an, a reason and it may be one of six things thrown against the wall to say, oh, I don't believe this, you know, I believe Trump. Um, and that's what their task has been, and it's a very limited task. You don't see a lot of them defending the president. You don't see a lot of them saying what he did was right. 
They just go after the process um, and create confusion, distractions, shiny objects. And I, you know, they've done a fairly good job of that. So we did everything we could to have a, the Berlin Wall between the impeachment and the day-to-day -day functions. And we kept the President of the United States away from it. He never really commented when asked. He said, I got a job to do. This is obviously, I don't think I have to tell you this, this is different than this White House and what this president is doing. So that's one thing that's, I think, um, I happen to think that's also because it's not unlike President Clinton, it's not like this president has a robust agenda. Okay, so it's not like I gotta go back to work to fill in the blank. You don't have something there. So that's one. Two, I would say um, there's two different things that are going on here that I think you gotta be, I think I'm uh, sensitive to. The Democrats are trying to persuade people, not just Democrats, but the public at large, of what's happening and move their opinion about the legitimacy, not only the inquiry and the investigation, but with their judgment, if it, that's what they conclude, is that this was an impeachable offense. The Republicans are not trying to persuade anybody. They're trying to hold on to their Republican base about both they think the process is wrong, and I think that's why they're going to the process, because if you get to the facts, it doesn't get pretty. And so their objective is not the same strategic objective that the Democrats have. And I think we gotta keep in mind, they're operating at different planes with, uh, it's very hard to talk with a microphone in your hand like this. They're <laughs> operating with uh, two different objectives. One, Democrats are trying to move those who have said, okay, I'm okay with the inquiry, but I'm not sure about impeachment itself. Republicans are not trying to move that crowd. It'd be nice if they did from their perspective, but that's not their objective. Their objective is to hold on to Republicans and not let them slip any farther from the President of the United States in their kind of 100% blind loyalty wherever this leads. So you gotta, if you think of that and understand each are going and have a different objective or goal line, then you'll understand, that, I think, the motivation. And then my conclusion of that is, from that perspective, the Republicans have probably done pretty good, but I think storming the room, et cetera, withholding information, attacking. Remember, every person coming up is a career foreign policy person. Some served in the military, but all of them have been serving in the United States of America. And you're gonna have a bunch of, as a former rehabbed congressman, you're gonna have a bunch of hacks whacking at career professionals. Some have worn the uniform of the United States in the past, some are presently wearing. I don't think that kind of fire breathing knuckle-dragging, Visigoth approach is gonna work for them. And I think when the cameras go on, if they look like that, I think that's gonna actually hurt them with the very audience that Democrats are trying to move in. I think that's important to remember. Yeah, and when, when I said uh, political theater before, I didn't mean Democrats needed to perform and you know create fireworks. Um, I do think if you, if you go back to um, Robert Mueller's testimony, that was a critical moment before we knew about Ukraine. And his testimony was so poor that I think most Americans looked at this and said, well, he doesn't have anything. And it, and it, was, it wasn't that he didn't have anything. He just, I don't know whether um, he wasn't able to forcefully present it or he decided that I don't wanna be here. I don't wanna be on camera. And so I'm just not gonna give anybody anything. What, what the Democrats have to do and what I think the wild card is is Democrats can control themselves, and I hope they will, Republicans will do their part, is how powerful are these witnesses when they tell their story? That's what we don't know. That's why we're going through this over the next couple of weeks. You know, George Taylor gave great deposition, but in person he may be halting like Bob Mueller, or he may, you know, he, he may come across as Thomas Paine, you know, saving our democracy. We don't know, and that's why it's worth watching, and, and that it matters. All of this, of course, is playing out amidst the backdrop of the looming elections. You talked about censure. Uh, it, could this in any way, shape, or form help the Democratic presidential field, or is all of this just such a distraction from that that Democrats stand to potentially, you know, lose the White House as they're starving for attention. I, th you know, listen. I think, on balance, this hurts Trump more than the Democrats. 
But here's the problem for the Democrats. We've got 17 candidates today. Everybody check your phones to see if we have 18 or 19, because we could by the end of this. Rom. Oh, no, no, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> Amy. Yes. So I know, I know Amy. You, you so know Amy. She so has I, know the answer, I know the answer to that one. Um, the, the problem is, you know, the, the process of nominating a candidate is putting them through a lot of tests. One of them is how they do on the media. And so I think the real risk for Democrats is that process gets um, overwhelmed. Uh, and we don't have the ability to see whether Elizabeth Warren is the best, or Pete Buttigieg, or Joe Biden, or Bernie Sanders, or you know someone who's back in the field who's going to, you know, if if the media is not paying attention, I'll give you an example from 2004. If we were going through impeachment um, at this time, Howard Dean would have won Iowa, and John Kerry would have come in fifth. But because the media was focused on Iowa and what he was saying every day, Kerry came out of nowhere and won and went on to the nomination. So I think there is a risk to the Democrats that the, the process doesn't work the way it should be. And maybe we don't nominate you know, the, the best candidate. Uh, uh, and there's nothing we can do about it uh, except try to get this thing, thing done quickly. And what of that? Mayor Bloomberg, should he be one of those? In yeah, number what, 17, number 18? <laughs> You know, Bill Clinton always used to say, let me answer your first, second question first, your first question, because he didn't want to answer your other question. So I'm going to stay with your first question. Right. Okay, no, we'll get back okay, to yeah, yeah, it's okay. So here's what I, uh, it's, it's more, it's, I, I agree with Joe, but I would add on this. The impeachment is not good for the president. It has a, with everything, if depending on what happens and depending on how the Democrats carry themselves, it can also backflip against. The real problem is, if you look at, look, if you look at this economy, Bill Clinton, George Bush, and Barack Obama, all of them would be somewhere between 58 and 62. You got 3.7% unemployment, growth is somewhere around 2%, it, it, wages are growing at 3%, and home appreciation is at 3%. This guy should be in the 50s, he's at 41, and he was at 44 just six weeks ago. He's slipping. With an economy, not that I think you, know, you can make different arguments about it, but by any terms or measurements is considered healthy. And he's not getting any of the quote unquote political benefits. So that's one. I do think the problem is and the challenge is you have to actually bring an agenda and a vision of the future to the voters to make that work. And impeachment, if it continues way past, let's just say into the spring, will actually blot out important time that Democrats have to make the case. And I think the overwhelming case is you know, Democrats are angry, swing voters are exhausted, not the same emotion. And I think that an impeachment process that continues to drag on while it's important from legal constitutional, purely from the political standpoint, for making the case of why President Trump's constant Twitter, constant activity, constant chaos is diverting the country from dealing with the core issues of education, investment, research and development, immigration, name your issue, that time frame will be shrunk dramatically and that's an important piece for victory ultimately in November. And we're going to go to audience questions in a bit, so get your thinking caps on, everyone. I do want you to respond to the possibility of a Mayor Bloomberg entering the race, particularly you just wrote a piece, I believe in Politico, that talked about uh, Democrats, again, Democratic presidential candidates erring by lurching so far left with, quote, a smorgasbord, I believe, of new entitlements and pie-in-the-sky ideas. Well, look, if you go through history, you have a presidential election, midterm there's a snapback, and then there's a snapback from the snapback. What is interesting about last week, not just Kentucky, Virginia, but also Delaware County and Pennsylvania. Delaware County is a suburban county, it'd be like DuPage. All five Republicans, it was five county commissioners, all five are up, all Republicans have been Republican county for 40 plus years. All five get swept out. The suburbs have been consistent since 2016. Whether you take red Kentucky, suburban Philadelphia, or purple Virginia. Unbelievably consistent and urban. And Bevin in Kentucky got 200,000 more votes this time than last time and lost. There's gonna be incredible turnout. So my view is that, in this process, is that the voters 
in Michigan gubernatorial, Kentucky gubernatorial, Wisconsin gubernatorial, legislative, congressional, battleground states and battleground districts have been consistent about this should be take healthcare, less about Medicare for all and more about controlling prescription drug prices and healthcare costs, less about you know seizing people's assault, assault weapons and more about background checks. It's very kind of get the job done, et cetera, as I said in this piece. And I think our presidential candidates are Medicare for all, guaranteed income, free college, and just go down the list. And it's like, you're in politics. Like the voters in literally 20 plus states, massive amount of congressional districts, massive amount of state legislature are sending you a singular message. And you seem to like be having a blinder on them. Is there no one that's doing that? Well, yeah, I mean, hold I, on, I'm this therapy. Oh. I got this thing here. I got, I got this, Joe. I got this. Yeah. 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 All right. Here's what happens. Okay. I, this is exactly what happened in the Roosevelt Room in the White House. Just, Joe, I got this, okay? okay. No, but here's and then what, I'd fix it. No, don't yeah, worry. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember it exactly like that, okay? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, that's, I, I, well, we'd like to talk about that, okay? Because I remember that podium not exactly working all the time for us. No. Uh, uh, so this is, we go way back. Don't worry about Empty this. Empty podium yeah, these days. Yeah. So here's what I think. And I actually compliment Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. They have brought their A game to the policy debate. I don't agree with it, but they brought their A game. What is missing on this, in this inside the Democratic tent is a full-throated defense, not of redistribution, but a full-throated defense of what I call inclusive growth. And the reason Bloomberg, Deval Patrick, John Kerry, or anybody's thinking about running is there's a space here to be filled for somebody to give an articulation of what I call the traditional liberal agenda that is different than redistribution. When you look at Medicare for all, guaranteed income, free college, et cetera, it's not associated with work, opportunity, and responsibility, the core principles of Democrats. And when you look at Bill Clinton's new covenant, you look at what Franklin Delano Roosevelt, when he talked about the four freedoms, et cetera, et cetera, the new frontier by John F. Kennedy, every one of those things talked about rights, responsibilities, opportunity, share it equitably across the system. Their indictment of the system, that it's rigged and it's only for a few, is right. Their prescription of how to solve it, in my view, we have not had a full party debate. There's been one side, it's on their China, and they brought their A game, hats off to them, and I think what has to happen now is the other side of the party has to speak up, be our check, and then the voters will decide. Yeah, and I, I I would just add to that I agree completely w with what Ram's saying. Is just stop there. Okay. <laughs> End of quote. Well, I, I'm going to quote Ram a few more times because he missed a couple of the brilliant things he was thinking but didn't say. <laughs> um, so he, this is what Ram was thinking. Nothing I think, got done in our way. Yes, That's nothing. All. <laughs> I, you know, I, I think this is one area where I fault uh, the media um, as not understanding who the Democratic base is. When you look at 2018, we picked up 40 seats. I think in, I hope I'm right about this, I think in 39 of those pickups, a moderate beat a more liberal Democrat in the primaries. So the, the, that's why we picked up so many seats. But what we heard about 2018 wasn't about um, uh, a, you know, uh, Virginia Four and uh, uh, Spanberger, we heard about AOC and, uh, you know, the squad and all of that. Now, what they did was they ran and made blue districts more progressive, which is important. That impacts the debate within the party, but it doesn't help us win any other place. The fact that moderates came out and won is the reason that we're going through impeachment now, because if we hadn't taken the House, none of this would be happening. But looking at 2020 in the primary process, you would think that the entire base of the Democratic Party was Democratic Socialist. And it's not. The Democratic base is made up primarily of African Americans who are not Democratic Socialists, um, uh, college educated um, uh, men and women 
who are sympathetic, I think, to a lot of the things that Warren and Sanders have aggressively uh, marketed, but I'm not sure they agree with all of them once they get the details. I mean, on Medicare for All, on Elizabeth Warren's proposal, among Democrats, when you ask them, are you for it, they say 62% are for it. When you tell them that you have to give up your private insurance, it goes to 29. That's among Democrats. You add Republicans and independents in there, and you'd be in the teens. Um, but the, but the, the media has covered this in such a way that that's where the base is. And the base is not there. And once you get out of white Iowa and New Hampshire, the, the traditional base of the Democrat, Democratic Party takes over. And I think a lot of what um, uh, Bloomberg and Deval Patrick and people who have been thinking about getting in is they're buying into this idea that the, the party has moved too far left. What I think what's happened is the most attractive candidates uh, who, who get a lot of the media attention or have moved beyond where the party is. And you know that may be an opening for someone to come in and say, hold on a second, this isn't where we are as a party. I think where Rom, what Rom described is where the party is. Welcome your questions. We would love to stick to national politics and impeachment, please. So just raise your hand and I'll bring the mic around. So my understanding is that when, if, and when the Congress, the Senate votes on impeachment, that they get to make the rules of how the voting goes. And there was some chatter about, it's supposed to be bipartisan, probably won't be, but there was some chatter that maybe if three senators would agree to secret ballots, that that could happen. And then there's talk of 30 plus Republican senators willing to vote for impeachment. Do you think, I can think of three states, some of which you mentioned that maybe they might be persuadable. Do you think that's an outside possibility? No. <laughs> uh, I mean, in the interest of time, I don't think you're gonna be able to get a secret ballot, given that it, both historically, all, all voting on every issue has been, is very public, both House and Senate. I, what happens is, and I have very limited knowledge, so I'm really on thin ice here, is they will draw up how they're gonna handle, if the articles of impeachment have been voted on in the House, the Senate trial, the rules upon which the trial will be held, et cetera, that will all be drawn up. But the idea that three senators could, the idea that they could do it is possible. I don't know the law. I don't know the rules of the Senate. What I do know is that, I, I, I'm going to go out on a limb on this, there's no way that the Senate's gonna accept the notion, or the public for that matter, that the, one of the most consequential votes will be done in private. It runs against the grain of the creed of who we are and the history of those two institutions that your vote is public. Yeah, I think the, you know, the, 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 the to remove the president, you need two thirds. To decide on the rules of how the trial is going to work, you need a majority. So I think that's where the three comes from. And it is possible that a Mitt Romney, a Lisa Murkowski, and maybe Cory Gardner uh, might say, no, 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 I think what the Democrats are proposing here, but I think that'll just be on the rules. I don't, I, I completely agree with Rom. They, they'll never, never uh, do gonna, this. I don't they'll see never it. do it uh, in private. I think the interesting thing, the most interesting thing I saw yesterday, though, was from uh, the Intel chairman, Richard Burr of North Carolina, uh, who will play a big role in putting this together, uh, because he kind of dropped the gauntlet to the Democrats and said the trial's gonna last eight weeks, and we're going to be in, 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 in the courtroom on the Senate floor six days a week, which basically screws any Senate Democrat running for president. So I think, you know, there's a lot to be worked out here. My guess is that this is going to the Senate. I don't think it'll be eight weeks, but, you know, the Republican leadership is beginning to put down a marker to Democrats to say, careful what you wish for. Because if you push too hard on some of this stuff, we'll give you eight weeks because none of our senators are running for president. Um, and, you know, you, he's, they want to create this, this cycle. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Um, so I think the media, like thinking fact over fiction, has played a huge role in this. And so forget Fox, but every other media outlet, if they would just stop covering anything that is not a fact, it would exclude a huge amount 
of what Trump says. It just wouldn't be covered. And the country would know real issues that are going on in our country, internationally. I think that would completely change the tone if every other media outlet did that. Um, why isn't that happening? Because this is just being perpetuated. I can't believe you're going to ask the two of us about the media, but this is like a freebie for me. Uh, I have like 20 years of built up anger, so thank you for that. <laughs> Ram, will be, <laughs> Ram will be dunking right now, yeah. so go for it. So no, I don't think that's possible. And I, let, let me say this, given what's happened at Northwestern, et cetera, even while I am angry at the media many times, they have, they're doing what they consider their jobs the best they can and in pursuit of truth. I don't think they get it right a lot of times, but they are in their mindset they're trying to do that. That's one. Two, uh, you know, there's an assumption that we all agree on what the facts are. When you say just cover the facts. We're having that, that real problem when we just take the issue of climate change on agreeing on that piece of it. The third piece I would just say to you is uh, it's a fair question about if you look at the arc of history of media, cable, introduction, then social media, it has m gone away from its roots as covering news and towards entertainment, which has created a space, ironically, and I don't think this is healthy, filled by those who do late night comedy at being a place where people get their information. It's not just generational. Look at, I mean, and so, it's a, if you really think about the fact that people go to Colbert, et cetera, and other shows to find information, it's a condemnation of what they are expecting out of the news hour, which has become more entertainment. And I think that's a question the profession has to ask itself, how it can continue to be true to its creed of being a journalist, uncovering the story, thick and thin, while it obviously goes for market share, eyeballs, et cetera, et cetera. And the truth is, the last 10 years, haven't. if everybody, you talk about a secret ballot, if journalists were honest to themselves, they would have to say, given the market pressure and all the other competitiveness, it hasn't been its finest hours. There are things that is done that stand out, but as an arc, it's not actually because of pressure. It's allowed itself to become more entertainment and less information. I agree with all that. I can't believe yeah. I was so restrained. Yeah. Uh, uh, let me add a couple of things. One is, first, um, uh, when it comes to the newspaper coverage, newspapers were, coming, were becoming irrelevant. They are very relevant now. What's going on between the Washington Post and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and that competitive nature it reminds me of uh, the Nixon years and, you know, Watergate and, uh, you know, Iran-Contra and how they, we, we wouldn't know all this stuff if it wasn't for journalists. So I think that's, that's a positive. And they figured out a way to stay in business with, with you know, going digital rather than uh, through a paper. Um, there's, there's two problems in addition to what Ram said that still exist. One is this idea that's taught uh, and ingrained in journalists that they have to tell both sides of the story. Uh, and I, you know, anyone who watched Meet the Press this weekend with Chuck Todd and uh, Jim Hines, uh, you know, he, he blew up this idea and he blew up Chuck Todd uh, by saying, how can you compare these two things? They're not comparable. Uh, and that's something the media, I think, has to wrestle with. They're not used to someone who shamelessly lies every time he opens his mouth. And they've been slow in, uh, particularly on television, in uh, dealing with that. The one idea, you, you can't not cover the president. Because if I take your theory of don't put it on unless it's a fact, it would mean you wouldn't put the president on TV. It just would mean that. Because he, in, in every paragraph, there's generally a couple of things that aren't true. Uh, that he just makes up. Um, the one idea that uh, that I've written about and has gone nowhere, but I'll tell you anyway, is I don't think the cable company should put the president on live. And the reason I say that is, you know, there, there's a there's an unspoken agreement between journalists and uh, politicians, and that is politicians will do their best to present the best case they can, but attach it in whatever way to the truth. Journalists will do what they can to uh, report on the essence of what the politician is saying, but say what they think uh, about it. And Trump is a new 
uh, phenomena, someone who lies all the time. And I think he's violated that unspoken agreement. And I think they should, you know, the, the, our democracy is not going to fall apart if the president in the Oval Office makes a statement at 11 and the public doesn't see it till 1145. And by taking that time, the journalists can fact check it. And in very real time, when you see the president speaking, they can also, through the use of graphics, say, that's not true. You know, the real number is this or the, what really happened was that, or they can set it up beforehand, which is the president is gonna tell you a lot of things. Here are some things that he got wrong. Can I, uh, can I say one? Uh, I will never ever compliment this president, but I'll give him one compliment. He has ignited a civic engagement that we have been waiting for for 50 years, and uh, because of what he has done, and. There is a level, not just, I see it among my three kids who are all in college or just out, but among all of us, we're not going back to the days, ah, eh, they're the same, they're just shades of gray, uh, who cares, there's no difference between the party, um, lesser of two evils. I think Donald Trump has, is a marker that will be put as a pin in a map that will be an inflection point. There's a level of civic engagement and, and, and you see it in voting patterns. You see it in consumption of information and news, et cetera. And so I don't, I'm, not, I'm not usually one for being Pollyannish. I actually believe that, this, that he has changed America to reignite its own sense awareness that things matter in the public space. That people used to in the past say, eh, I don't care about politics. Not anymore. People know that political decisions, elections, campaigns, matter and staying involved in your citizenship matters and that will be his contribution the only thing this guy has ever done positively and it was unintended so we're going to take one last question amanda you mentioned this earlier i'm, I'm really curious uh as to your thoughts on uh, michael bloomberg getting into the race is he that person that's going to fill the void <clears throat> excuse me that you talked about in, in the party I'll take that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I tend to doubt it. Um, you know, I think Michael Bloomberg um, did a very good job as mayor of New York. I live in New York. I didn't live there when he was there, but uh, you know, the city is very different than uh, before he took over. Uh, but Bloomberg does not have a natural constituency among Democratic voters. There, there's not. You know, it was not African Americans, it's not, not college educated working class whites. These are not people. He did not do well in New York among African Americans. He has, you know, things like um, supporting stop and frisk, which uh, was a big debate in New York. And, you know, some people think it turned the city around as far as um, uh, safety, and some people think it's unconstitutional and racial profiling. Uh, that is not a debate that injected into the Democratic primary is going to work for him. Um, so there are a lot of things working against him. There are a couple things working for him. One is the sense of calmness and competence in contrast to, to President Trump. The second is $1 billion. Um, and, you know, I think his strategy will be to ignore the first couple of um, uh, caucuses and primaries that are really retail politics where you have to go in and meet voters and talk to them one-on-one -on -one and go to you know what we call wholesale politics you know blanketing California with advertising on TV digital all that big states super Tuesday all of that but I'm very skeptical um, you know it's interesting that you know Deval Patrick is talking about getting in and um, you know, he's got some connection with the Democratic base, um, you know, both through his history uh, at the Justice Department and as the governor of Massachusetts. What he doesn't have is a billion dollars. Um, and it's very late in the process to be trying to raise money and stand up a campaign, something that Bloomberg can do and has already done and did while no one was watching. Um, so I don't think either of them um, will fundamentally change the race. I, th I think, though, the impact Bloomberg could have is on, I think, what both Ram and I have been alluding to, which is um, uh, sort of surfacing the core Democratic ideas, 
you know, which are about work and responsibility and opportunity and all the things that we used to talk about 20 years ago and John Kennedy talked about in a different version and using different words and really um, counteract what, um, what uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren have done a great job of grabbing the debate and dominating it. So I think in the end, I, I, I think he may serve a very uh, significant uh, function in the race and one that I would find to be positive and maybe some people to the left of me would find as negative and would be a billionaire throwing his money around and doing what billionaires do. But I don't think there's a path for him to be the nominee um, unless you know we get to the convention and it's brokered. And even if we get there, I don't think he'll be the person the party will turn to. So here, a couple things. One is I think that uh, you look at the field here, and I think the overarching goal is winning. I know a lot of people want to go through all the issues and stuff, and legitimately, but the reason John Kerry moved from fifth a month out to first in Iowa was voters basically said Howard Dean, Dick Eppert, wasn't the horse they wanted to ride into November. And they made a political calculation of what was the best horse to ride in. The reason it's still fluid in Iowa is everybody kind of looks at a candidate and they, go, and they start evaluating and then they get nervous. And so there's still an opportunity. Second is, I really, going back to what I said earlier, this has been a one side, the analysis of the problem is you have a rigged system, a concentration of wealth and a concentration of power and America has never prospered both politically or economically when that happens. That is true. Their prescription to that diagnosis is a redistribution. There has not been a full-throated defense of what I call traditional democratic values around shared opportunity, responsibility, and around the principle of work. Any one of these candidates, Deval or uh, Mike, can shake that up. Third, I would just say this is, look, I think the person that's most benefit from Mike Bloomberg and Deval is Mayor Pete. And the reason I think that is, you know, Elizabeth was rising, and then she got the NBA treatment from journalists around Medicare for All. And it's, you know, taking a toll. Mayor Pete's doing really well in Iowa right now, real well in New Hampshire, which meant the, voter, the press was gonna say, okay, we're gonna about to give you the welcome to the NBA. Could happen in the debate, but you know, that's where it happened for Elizabeth Warren at first. And right now, like third grade soccer, they're running over and checking out Mike and Deval, and Mayor Pete's like got another 20 yards of free running room back in Iowa and New Hampshire. And those are not inconsequential because last time I checked, they're still number one and number two in the process. So could he have a road there? You know, as a former finance director for Bill Clinton, if you can write a billion dollars, I kind of pay attention really quickly, okay? It's, it has an impact. Is it gonna be everything? And it's not just his history, et cetera. If I were him, and I do think with Joe, it's a very complicated, circuitous route. My guess is he's gonna go right after Donald Trump. And he's gonna look at all the Democrats and say, who do you want? in November, P put yourself past this process, get yourself into Milwaukee and move forward. And he's gonna go right and make this a mano to mano, Mike Bloomberg, Donald Trump. I think it's very complicated, that said. I still believe his candidacy, Deval, et cetera, speak to that, that nobody has yet addressed what has traditionally been the core voice of the Democratic Party and the debate has been, and again, I don't agree with it, but I take my hats off when I see success. They have brought Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren their A game to the policy debate. I don't think redistribution economics is the right answer. It's the right answer either economically or politically. That said, every piece of the debate from all four debates have been about the agenda set, table set by Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and you gotta compliment them for it. Well, there we that. have it. <laughs> Okay, okay. Applause, please. What Ram said. Thank you.